Hello everyone. In this section, we are going to install Python and then we will do a short crash course of Python. To install Python, we will first go to www.anaconda.com. Anaconda is the full distribution of Python. It installs Python, Jupyter Notebook and other relevant libraries for you. Here we will click on download button. Then again on the download button and we will install Python 3.7 version. Save the file. There may be slight variation in syntax of version 3.7 and 2.7. So I recommend you to use 3.7 version only for this course. Please note that there are different versions for Mac and Windows. So choose the version according to your operating system. So once you have downloaded the file, you can start the installation by double clicking it. We'll click on run. Click on next, next, right. we'll click on all users and click next, click on next, click on install, So you may have to wait for 10 to 20 minutes for this installation. We are jumping to the next dialog box. So now we will hit the next button. We will hit on install Microsoft VS Code. Make sure that you have internet connectivity while doing this. Now we will click on next. If you want to learn more you can click on this check boxes or else you can click finish. I hope you have installed Anaconda on your system. So let's get started. First we will learn how to open Jupyter Notebook. To open Jupyter Notebook there are three different ways. The easiest way is to open it through Anaconda Navigator. So let's first open Anaconda Navigator on our system. We'll go to Start menu and search for Anaconda Navigator. Click on it to open it. It may take two to three minutes to open depending on your system configuration. Once you open Anaconda Navigator, you will get this home screen. You can see there are different tools available within Anaconda. So if you scroll, you will see all the tools. But we want to open Jupyter Notebook. So we will click on Jupyter Notebook. We'll click on launch. Again, it may take two to three minutes to open it depending on your system. You will not get any additional window of Jupyter Notebook. It will directly open in your default browser. So if you are using Chrome, it will open in Chrome. If you are using Internet Explorer, it will open in Internet Explorer. The screen you are seeing is the home screen of Jupyter Notebook. The files and folders you are seeing here are the files and folder present in your default directory. You can also navigate through these folders to open any Python notebook that you have in these folders. For example, I have this notebooks lecture one, lecture two, pre-processing in my default directory. I can just click on this to open this notebooks. You can notice the extension of Jupyter notebooks are I, P, Y, N, B. It means I Python notebooks. So all the Python notebooks that you are saving through Jupyter Notebook, 
they will all have this extension. Now this is the first method to open Jupyter Notebook and this is the easiest method. Now let's move on to the second method. We will close this. We will also close this Anaconda Navigator. The second way to open Jupyter Notebook is by Anaconda Prompt. So just search for Anaconda Prompt in your search bar. Click on it. Anaconda prompt will open this black window. Here you can see this C users Abhish is your current directory. You will be getting your current default directory here in your own system. In front of this, we just have to write Jupyter Notebook. We will write Jupyter Notebook. And hit enter. Again, it may take two to three minutes. So, just like with the previous method, you will be able to see Jupyter Notebook home screen in the new tab of your web browser. Now, let's move on to the third method. The third method of opening Jupyter Notebook is by using command prompt. For this, you first have to open the command prompt. If you are not aware of how to open command prompt, you first have to open the run window. You can just press Windows R or you can type run in your search bar. Here also you will get the search result and click on this run. Here to open command from this run window we have to write cmd, we will write cmd and click on ok. This black window is command prompt, it is looking similar to anaconda prompt. This directory is your default directory. And here also, just like with Anaconda prompt, you have to write Jupyter Notebook. And hit enter. This will also open the Jupyter Notebook in your web browser, just like the previous methods. As I told you earlier, these are the files and folders that are present in your default directory. And if you want to open Jupyter Notebook outside this default directory, you can change the directory from the command prompt by writing CD. So we will close this Jupyter Notebook. To change the directory, we will write CD and then after a space, we will mention the location of new folder. Hit enter. You can see earlier my default directory was user Abhish. Now I have moved the, this directory to this new location, the folder I created in the desktop. And just like with our previous method, I will write Jupyter Notebook. You can see now our default directory of this Jupyter Notebook is our new folder which is new location and you can see as the folder was empty there are no notebooks present here while previously in our default directory there were several notebooks and folders. This will be helpful to you if your notebooks are present in some other drive or some other directory other than your default directory. Or if you want to save your files into some particular folder outside your default directory. Also note that this third method 
of opening Jupyter Notebook from command prompt may not work in your system. You may have to change some system variables to make it work. I will pose the method to change those system variables in a separate lecture so that you can use this method also to open Jupyter Notebook. You can check that lecture if you want, but that is totally optional for this course. For now, I will recommend you to use this default directory and open Jupyter Notebook by the first method of Anaconda Navigator. If you want, you can just create a folder in this default directory and save all your files there. In the next lecture, I will tell you how to find this default directory in your system. And in the rest of the lecture, we will be only using first method which is opening Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda Navigator to open Jupyter Notebook. Anaconda also comes with Spider, so if you do not want to use Jupyter Notebook, you can use default Python window. To do that, you can launch Spider instead of Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda Navigator. But in my personal opinion, Jupyter Notebook is much better than Spider for beginners and the first time users. And that's why we will be only using Jupyter Notebook for this course. In the next video, I will tell you some basic syntax of Python and how to use Jupyter Notebook with its different features. So we have started this Jupyter Notebook from Anaconda Navigator. Now to create a new notebook, click on this new button in the top right corner and click on Python 3. This will open a new notebook in a new tab. This is default Jupyter Notebook interface. In Notebook, you write and run your codes in small segments and these segments are called cells. Apart from executing your code, these cells can also be used for commenting and it is really helpful to make your code readable and easy to follow. To write the code, you just have to click on this cell and for example, to add two numbers, you can just write 2 plus 2. So this is where you will write your codes. To execute this code, just press Control Enter. So you can write your codes in the cell and you will get the output just below it. So you can see for input, we have IN and for all the outputs, we have OUT. On the top, you can see different menu items. File contains general options like saving, printing or renaming. Edit contains cell related options like cut cell, copy cell, paste cell or delete cell. View contains interface related options and inserts contains option to insert new cells. Cells menu item contains execution related options. And as the name suggests, help contains references and manuals on how to use Jupyter Notebook. You can also find the list of shortcuts from here. Now most of the options we are going to use are also available in the form of buttons. So suppose if I want to rename this file as lecture 1, I will do that by clicking on this file name untitled and just rename it to lecture 1. To save this file, we can click on this save button. It will automatically save your file in your default directory. And next time you open Jupyter Notebook, you will be able to see this file in your default directory from Jupyter Notebook homepage. 
there are also buttons to cut copy paste we also have a button to execute our codes so again if i if i click on my cell and click on run it will execute the cell now you can see this drop down menu is saying code this means the cell we have selected is containing a code if i want it to contain a comment i can change it to either raw or markdown formatting if i change it to markdown or raw our python kernel will know that the cell the content of this particular cell is just for commenting and it will not execute it the presence of this feature make our code more readable and understandable so i will go ahead and change the format of this cell to md which is markdown you can see when i am changing my cell to markdown the input symbol goes away there is no input symbol here input symbols are present only in the front of codes i can write anything in this md cell and python treats this as a comment so let's go ahead and write this is a md cell markdown cells also supports markdown formatting so if i want to give heading i can use pound symbol so we'll give a heading heading 1 if i execute this cell you can see since i use pound symbol in front of this heading 1 the font for heading 1 is in the heading format we can also use multiple pound symbols to change this size so if i use two symbols for heading 2 you can see heading 2 is slightly smaller than heading 1 you can also use 3 4 5 or 6 pound symbol to change the size of this headings you can also use asterisk symbols to give bullets so if i write asterisk if i write bullet point this asterisk symbol will be directly converted into a bullet so if i execute it you can see the asterisk symbols are now converted into bullets and we are seeing all our points in proper bullet points there are multiple features for editing markdown you can google it and if you want you can learn more about this formattings again note that markdown are just for commenting your python is not actually executing this cells the next cell format is raw raw is similar to markdown but it does not support formatting so if you convert it to raw if you convert it to raw it will remain like this you will not be able to get formatting out of this cells again raw is also for commenting and python will not execute it code is the format in which we write our codes and python will only execute cells that are marked as codes you can see the format for this cell is code therefore i can use my codes in this cell so if i write 2 plus 2 i can execute it either by clicking this run button or by pressing a shortcut key that is control enter for now i will click on this run button similarly if i write 5 plus 3 this time i will use control enter control enter is a shortcut to run the cell 
to execute the cell. But most of the time, we also want to enter a blank cell beneath this cell. In that case, I can use Alt Enter instead of Control Enter. Alt Enter will execute the cell. Also, it will insert a blank cell just below this cell. So if I write Alt Enter, it has executed the cell and it has inserted a new cell, a new blank cell just below this cell. Another small point I want to tell you about cells is editable and non-editable mode. So let's first insert a new cell. Now if you try to write anything, so if I write start tech academy, nothing will happen because these cells are not editable right now. You can also notice the color of this cell is blue. The border around this cell is blue. This suggests that the cell currently is in non-editable format. If you press enter, you can see the cursor inside the cell and now the blue color has been changed to green color. Now you can write anything. If I write start tech academy, you can see we are able to write this inside a cell. This mode is editable mode. If I press escape, you can see the color has been changed to blue and now we have entered a non-editable mode. In non-editable mode, you can navigate through different cell and if you want to edit it, you have to press enter and the cursor will appear inside the cell and the cell boundary will change to green color. These two shortcuts of entering into editable and non-editable mode are very important and it will lay a foundation for other shortcuts as well. So suppose if you want to change the formatting from code to markdown, you can put your cell into non-editable mode. So I will press escape and then I will press M. M is a shortcut for markdown formatting and you can see that the cell type has been changed from code to markdown. Since right now I am in non-editable mode, I can press Y to change the format of this cell to code. Now to edit the code, I just have to press enter to enter into editable mode. Now again, to go back to non-editable, press escape. Now I can use shortcuts to change the cell format. If I press R, I can change the format of this cell to raw. And to switch back, I just have to press Y. These shortcuts are very handy when you are using Python. And it will save a lot of time for you. Again, now the shortcut to insert new cell is just to enter into non-editable mode, press escape if you are in editable mode and press A. A will insert a blank cell above your existing cell and similarly B will enter a cell below your existing cell. So I want you to remember these six shortcuts. First is enter to enter into editable mode of a cell. Second is escape to go into the non-editable mode of the cell. Third is control enter to execute your selected cell. Fourth one is alt enter to execute your selected cell and enter a new blank cell below your cell. The fifth one is M, use of M in non-editable mode. It will change the cell format from code to markdown. And the last one is Y. In the non-editable mode, if you press Y, it will change the format of your cell from raw or markdown to code format. Similarly, 
There is one more shortcut if you want to delete your cell. Just press DD in non-editable mode. It will delete the selected cell. Now let's start learning Python syntaxes by performing some basic arithmetic operations. The most basic operation is addition of two numbers. We can use plus symbol to do that. So we will write 2 plus 2 and we will execute this cell by pressing Alter Enter. You can see we are getting result as an output. The second arithmetic operation is subtraction. We can use minus symbol. So if we write 5 minus 2 and execute it, we are getting the result. Next is multiplication. We can use asterisk symbol to multiply two numbers. If we write 3 into 4 and execute it, we are getting 12 as our output. Next is division. We'll write 5 slash 2. Now to use power or exponential functions, we can use two asterisk symbols. So if I write 5 asterisk asterisk 2 means that we are squaring 5. Next is modulus or remainder function. It will return the remainder of the division. So if I write 5 modulus 2, we are getting 1 as our result. So if we divide 5 by 2, we get 1 as a remainder. We can also use multiple operators. So I can write 5 into 2 plus 4. If I execute this command, I will get 14 as a result. You can notice that Python is following the board mass rule. First it is multiplying 5 and 2, then it is adding 4 to that result. It is better to use parentheses while using multiple operators. So if we want to add 2 and 4 first and then multiply it with 5, we can write 5 and in parentheses we can write 2 plus 4. You can see here we are first adding 2 and 4 which is 6 and then multiplying this number with the 5. So the result is 30. When you are using multiple operators, it is always recommend to use parentheses. We can also assign these values to variable. So I can assign where 1 equal to 2. So now my variable where 1 is containing a value 2. If I just write where 1 and execute it, Python will display its value. You can see now we are getting 2 as an output. We can also use arithmetic operators while defining the variable. So if I just change the value of var1 to our previous argument that is 5 into 2 plus 4. Our var1 will now contain a value 14. You can also notice that we have replaced the value 2 with value 14. So if you reassign value to some variable, it will just replace that value. Now Python also supports comparison operators. So if I write 5 greater than 2, the result is true. Similarly, it also supports less than less than equal to and more than equal to so for example i can write 3 less than equal to 2 the result should be false and we are getting false as our output now let's move on to strings in python so how can we pass a string in a python if i just write st python tutorial and execute it I'm getting an error because 
we need to pass strings in double quotes or single quotes. So we can write in double quotes st python tutorials. Here we use double quotation marks. You can also use single quotes to pass a string. But sometime your string may contain single quotes in between. So therefore it is recommended to use double quotes while passing strings. Just like numbers we can also assign this string to some variable. So we can write str1. Here str1 is our variable and we are assigning value st python tutorial. Now my str1 variable contains this value. Now if we want to display the value of our str1 variable, I will just write str1 and then execute this command. You can see we are getting our output and you can also notice that stpython tutorial is coming in quotation marks. There is also a separate print function in python to print the output. To print the output we will write print and in brackets we will write str1. You can now notice that there is no quotation marks and now the values are printed and they are not a part of output. You can see when we just executed str1, we were getting the content of this variable in the form of output. You can see this out written here, but when we are printing it, Python is actually printing it and this is not a part of output. Python even provides formatting option with this print function. So suppose I wanted to use some variable inside my print command. I can do that by using print formatting. For example, in our previous example, in the phrase stpython tutorial, I wanted to pass variable x, which will take value python or r depending the value. So if my x is python, I wanted to print stpython tutorial. If my x is r, I wanted to print str tutorial. Or if x is sql, I wanted to print st sql tutorial. So let's create this variable x and assign it value r. Notice that we are using double quotes to assign value to this variable. We will first write print and in brackets we will put quotation marks and we will pass the array string which is st and then since I want my second word to be this variable x I will I will give curly brackets. And my third word is a constant which is tutorial so I will write tutorial. Now I want to tell python what goes inside this curly bracket. So after this print command I will put a dot and write format. And in parenthesis I can write my variable name which is x. Let's run this. We are getting this error because dot format should be inside the print command. So we just copy paste it. Yeah, and now if we execute it, you can see we are getting str tutorial. If I change my value of x to SQL and then again run this print command. You can see now since our x is SQL 
the output statement is stsql tutorial so what happening here is the curly bracket in print command tells python to take the value of variable that is mentioned in the dot format parenthesis if i want i can also pass two or more than two variables the syntax will remain the same in that case and you have to mention the variable names in dot format in the order you want them to be filled in the curly bracket so if we just write print and in bracket we'll write st then curly brackets here our variable x will come then after this tutorial and then another curly bracket and in dot we can write x and the variable we created earlier that was var1 if we execute this you can see our var1 variable was containing 14 so our printed string is st sql tutorial 14 now let's discuss some important functions related to strings the first function is length function it helps us to find the length of our string the syntax of length function is len now if we want to check the length of our str1 variable we can just mention str1 inside parenthesis after length you can see the length of our variable str1 is 18 also note that space is also a character so this length 18 is count of all the characters including spaces and other punctuation marks as well another string function which we frequently used is replace function you must have used replace function in word or notepad where you search the word and then replace that word with a new word replace function in python works exactly the same you have to give two words first the word you want to search and second the word you want to replace it with so let's again print our str1 variable right now my str1 contains st python tutorial if i want to replace this word python with sql i will write str1 dot replace and in brackets first the word i want to replace that is python also remember that python is case sensitive language so i have to pass python in lower case since my variable contain python in lower case i want to replace this variable with sql so after a comma i will write sql you can see that the word python has now been replaced with sql i can also save this value in another variable so let's save this value in another variable called x i will copy paste this whole function if i print x i will get this value st sql tutorial now let's move on to string indexes and string slicing you can see a string is a collection of several individual characters for example in our variable x s is a single character t is a single character and our whole string is a collection of such characters these characters are present at specified position in our string so for example s is present 
at the first position t is present at the second position and similarly we have a space at the third position we can extract this individual characters from our variable by specifying their positions this concept of extracting characters by their position is known as string indexing or or string slicing one thing to note here is that in python indexing starts with zero so our character s is present at zeroth index t is present at first index and space is present at two index so if i want to extract the character which is present at the first index i will just write our variable name which is x and in a square bracket i will mention the index which is 1 if we execute this we will get t as our output since t was present at the first index position is different from index the position of t is 2 but since the index starts from 0 our s was present at 0th index and our t was present at 1st index i can also mention multiple index so if i want all characters which are present from index 2 to index 5 i will write x and in a square bracket i will write 2 then i will provide a colon symbol and then i will write 5 this means that i want all characters which are present between index 2 and 5 notice that our first character is space our second character is s and our third character is q we are getting all the characters that are present at index 2 index 3 and index 4 we are not getting our index 5 variable because the second argument is always excluded while slicing the string using indexes so 2 colon 5 means character present at index 2 3 and 4 similarly if we write x bracket 4 colon 6 it will return the characters which are present at index 4 and 5 index 6 will be excluded from our selection indexes also supports negative argument negative stands for counting from the back side of the string so minus 1 will be the last character of string minus 2 will be the second last character and so on so if i wanted to print last character of my string i will write x and and in a square bracket i will mention minus one we are getting l as our output since the last character of our variable x was l while slicing you can also skip the arguments so if i write x and in square bracket i will write colon 5 this means that i want all the characters from the start of my string till the index 5 if i run this you can see we are getting all the characters from the start of the string similarly if i want all the characters from index 5 to the end of the string i will write x and in bracket i will write 5 colon you can see all the characters from the fifth index is present in our output now what if if i wanted alternate characters from my string i can do that by mentioning the third parameter which is the step parameter so earlier we were passing only two parameters the starting point and then after the colon we were passing the end point 
we can also pass the third argument after another colon symbol as a step argument. So if I write x and in the square bracket I will write 2 colon 10. This means I want all the characters from index 2 to index 9. Remember index 10 is excluded. But if I write 2 colon 10 colon 2 this means I want characters with a step as 2 so I will be getting characters present at index 2 and since our step is 2 it will directly jump to index 4 and then to index 6 and then to index 8 if I run this if I print my x just to compare our output you can see our character at index 2 was space character at index 4 was q then character at index 6 was again space and then character at index 8 was u. Similarly, if you want to change this step size to 3, 4 or anything, you can do that. One thing you may have noticed is that we are not defining variables while creating the variables. As with the other programming languages such as C, SQL or C++, we don't have to define variable types in Python. Python will automatically assign the type depending on the value present in that variable. So if you are passing variable x as 1, Python will automatically assign x as an integer. If you are passing x as an string, it will automatically assign x as an string. Or if you are passing it as a decimal point, it will get a floating point type. To know the type of variable, we can use type function. We just have to write type and in parenthesis write the variable name. Here we will write x and we should get a string as our output. You can see the type of our variable x is str. Similarly, if we get the type of our variable that is variable 1 we are getting int since our variable 1 was containing 14 as a value now if we assign variable 2 a value of 5 divided by 2 we print this variable 2 you can see that variable 2 is taking a value 2.5 if you want to get the type of this variable 2 we will write type and in bracket we will write variable 2 we should be getting floating number as decimal is present in our value now let's move on to lists lists are very similar to a string except that each element can be of any type in a strings each element was a character but in lists each element can be of any type so to define a list we have to use square brackets so if i write l1 l1 is our variable name then in a square bracket if i write 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 5 and run this l1 is our list to check write type l1 it is showing that the type of l1 character is list to print all its value we write print l1 and we are getting all the values that l1 is containing just like strings, 
we can also use the same slicing techniques to manipulate lists so if i write l1 square bracket 0 this will give me element present at the 0th location which is 1 so here 1 is at location 0 2 is at, at location 1 3 is at location 2 4 at 3 and 5 at 4 just like a string i can use colon to select multiple elements so if i write 0 colon 3 it will give me the first three elements here the location 3 is excluded so i will get elements present at location 0 location 1 and location 2 3 is excluded just like slicing in the strings you can also use steps so if i write l1 now if i want to select all the elements i will just write colon then i will write another colon so first argument was for the starting location second argument was for the stopping location and the third argument is for the steps we are not giving a starting and stopping location since we want all the elements and now we are defining a step as two so it will give me all the alternate elements of my list so again it is ignoring two and four since we provided a step of two it is not necessary for list to have all the elements of same type you can assign different types of element in a single list so if i write l2 equal to square bracket 1 comma if i want to provide a string i will write in double quotation a comma if i want to provide floating point numbers i will write 1.0 and if i run this my l2 is created and the data type of my first element is int, second element is a string, and the third element is float. But we can assign all this in a single list as well. So if we want to check, we can check using the type operator. If we write type, now inside L2, I want the data type of first element. So I will write 0. And it is int because 1 is our int. Now, if I write type L2 square bracket 1, which is string because our A is in double quotation and we have provided it as a string. Write L2. Our L2 is a list, that's why if we just write type of L2, it will showing us list. We can also provide list as an element of another list. So if we write L3 equal to L2 comma 1 comma 2.0. If we run this command, so we have provided list L2 list inside L3. So if we print L3, here our first element is a list which is L2 and our second element is int and third element is float. So just to check if we write type of L3 comma 0, this is showing us as list because we have provided L2 inside of L3. Now, we have mentioned how to select the first element of L3. We can just write L3 and in bracket we can write 0. This will give us the first element. Now, my first element is a list. So, how to select first element of that list? We can write L3. In square bracket, I will first write 0. Right now, I am accessing my first element which is a list now if i want the second element of this list i will write in a square bracket one 
if i run this command it will give us the character a this types of list are called nested lists because we have lists inside a list now you can also create lists using special functions such as range so if i write list and in bracket i write range in range i have to provide the starting point stopping point and the step so if i provide 0 as my starting point 10 as my stopping point and step as 2 and if i run this range will provide me an output of 0 2 4 6 8 and i am using list keyword to convert this output in the form of list so we can create another variable l4 equal to list range 0 to 10 with step 2 now if we print our variable l4 we can see 0 is our first element 2 4 6 and then 8 if you want to sort it in the descending order we will write l4 dot sort sort is a function and the argument here is reverse equal to true if we don't give this reverse equal to true it will automatically sort it in the ascending order but we want it in the descending order that's why we are providing argument reverse equal to true now if we check l4 you can see it is sorted in the descending order our first element is 8 which is the largest and the last element is 0 the smallest element if we want to add more elements into our list we can use append function we will write l4 dot append and in bracket we mention the variable here we are writing 10 this add the value 10 at the end of the list as you can see we have 10 at the end of the list if we want to change value of any element we can just write that element address so l4 square bracket 0 this is our first element and we want the value of this element to be 3 so if we write equal to 3 it will automatically change the value of of the first element to 3 so earlier it was 8 now the value is 3 if we want to change values of multiple elements we can write l4 we want to change the value of second and third so we'll write 1 colon 3 this means element second and third since 3 is not included and 1 is included and then in the square bracket we can write the values so for example if we write 5 comma 7 now we are replacing this 6 to 5 and this 4 to 7 if we run this and you can see the values are now changed in a way we are providing another list to replace the elements of this list now if we want to insert an element at an specific index we will do this by using a keyword insert so if we write l4 insert and we want to insert this element at the first position so we will write 0 since 0 is our first position and we will write 15 so if we write 15 in double quotation this means we are passing this element as a string so let's do this you can see we have inserted this 15 string at the first position now all my other elements are shifted by one space now if we want to remove element of this 
string we can do this by using two commands first is the remove function and the second is the delete function remove function will remove the value of that element so for example if i write remove bracket 3 l4 dot remove bracket 3 it will first search the elements which have the value 3 in that case this is the second element so it will delete this second element if we run this whereas if i am using delete it will delete the position of that element so for example if we write del comma l4 and then i have to specify the location so if i write 0 that means the first location will be deleted so if we run this again run l4 you can see 15 is now deleted we are only only 5 7 2 0 and 10 are remaining now if you want to know more about list you can write help help is a keyword you can use anywhere so you can write help and in bracket you can write list and if you run this you will get all the information about list we are not going to discuss all here and just a quick tip if you want to remove your output just select this cell convert it to raw nb and then again convert it to code and now your output is gone so if you have some large output you can you probably want to do this now let's move on to tuples tuples is another data type provided by python So tuples are just like list except that they cannot be modified once created. That's why we call them immutables. So tuples are immutables and a list is mutable. So to assign a tuple we use parentheses. So for lists we use square bracket. For tuples we use parentheses. So if we write t1 equal to parenthesis 1 comma 2 so if you see when we were outputting the lists there were square bracket at the end and at the start but for the tuples we have parenthesis and we cannot change the values of this elements so just to try if you want to change the value of first element you can write t1 then square bracket 0 equal to 5 since this is a tuple we will get an error while running this so you can see the error is tuple object does not support item assignment you cannot change the value of tuple once created to get the type of this t1 type t1 you can see the type is tuple there are very limited use cases of tuples and we will hardly use tuples in our analysis so let's move on to the next data type which is dictionary Dictionaries are also like lists except that each element is a key value pair and the syntax for assigning dictionaries is using curly brackets. In a list we use square bracket, in tuple we use parentheses, in dictionaries we will use curly brackets. So in a list there are indexes starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Here you can say that you are assigning this indexes on your own. So for each element you have to assign an index which we call a key and the element is called as value. That's why we define dictionaries as a collection of key value pairs. So to assign a variable d1 which is a dictionary we will write equal to curly brackets. Now here first we have to 
write the key key one and then write colon and the value of this key which is one comma key two so in a list there were indexes 0 1 2 3 4 this key 1 key 2 key 3 are just like indexes if we run this if we write d1 run this you can see in this we were only getting the values in here we are getting first the keys and then the value so if you want you can see the type of this d1 right type d1 the type is dictionary now if i want to grab the first value i will write d1 and in square bracket i will write key1 We run this you can see for the key key one we have a value of one in a list we were using directly using the indexes such as 0 1 2 3 4 in dictionaries we have to use this keys to get the value of that pair so if I try to write like this d1 square record 0 that is the first element I will get an error I always have to refer this value using the key of this value so python also supports conditional statements such as if else or else if and it also supports loops such as for loop and while loop so in this lecture we will cover important libraries of python which is numpy pandas and seaborn so we will open our jupyter home screen and click on new python 3 notebook first we will cover the numpy numpy is the core numerical computing package in python and its code type is nd array also known as numpy array you can change the title of notebook and save this there is also an auto save feature in jupyter notebook so you don't have to worry about saving it NumPy package is almost used in all numerical computation using Python and it provides high performance vector, matrix and higher dimensional data structures for Python. It is implemented in C and Fortran and that's why it is much faster than Python inbuilt functions. To use NumPy we need to import the module. To import the module we will write import NumPy as np since we are using anaconda there is no need to install this libraries all the important libraries are already installed using the anaconda and if you are using python you have to use pip install in the command prompt to install this library there are various ways to initialize the numpy array we can either convert existing python list or tuple or we can generate a numpy array using functions like a range and line space so let's start with numpy array we'll create a variable np1 equal to np dot array so array is a function this is a function of numpy package that's why we have to write np so in the first statement we install numpy as np that's why we have to write np before every function of this numpy package that's why we'll write np dot array and then in the brackets we will input a list so as you remember list are 
covered by square bracket so in a square bracket we will write a list 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 we enter if we write NP and then run this you can see the output is showing us an array which contains element 1 2 3 and 4 if we write type of NP1 will give us output that it is a numpy nd array to create a matrix you have to pass two lists it's a nested list in which there are two lists so we'll write mat1 equal to np array np dot array and in parenthesis we'll write a nested list which contain two lists If we run this, we'll get a matrix. You can see this is an array in which our first row is this, which contains element 1 and 2, and the second row is 3, 4. Our NP1 is a one dimensional array, whereas MAT1 is a two dimensional array. To look at the shape of these two arrays, we'll write np1 dot shape dot shape is a keyword that will give us the shape of that array so np1 is our single dimensional array which contains only four element if we write mat1 dot shape so here you can see that this is a matrix which contain two rows and two columns Unlike Python list in which you can combine multiple types of elements, in NumPy array you have to insert only similar types of element. To get the type of elements of NumPy array, you have to write D type. So I write mat1 dot D type. It will give me the type of data elements in my mat1 array you can see the elements are integer i can change the value of element by just using equal to operator so if i write mat1 square bracket so my first element is 0 comma 0 i write 0 comma 0 equal to 5 it will assign the first element a value 5. So if I output this, you can see that first element is now changed to 5 instead of 1 earlier. If I try to assign some string value to this array, we'll get an error. Because as I said earlier, all the elements of NumPy array should be of same type. So you can see we are getting an error because all the other elements are of type integer and we cannot pass a string element into this numpy array that's why we are getting an error in list we use the function range to generate numbers in a sequence in numpy array we can use a function a range similarly to generate elements so for example if i want a new variable mat2 equal to now i want it to start from 0 to 10 with a step of 1 i write np dot a range and then the start point which is 0 comma the end point which is 10 comma step which is 1 if i run this you can see that now mat2 contains all the values from 0 to 9 the stopping point is excluded but the starting point is included similarly if we want to include both the elements both the starting point and the stopping point we have to use lin space function so we'll write mat3 equal to np dot lin space
our starting point is 0 our ending point is 10 and here instead of steps we have to mention the number of elements we want so if we want 20 elements we have to write 20 and if we see we have 20 elements filled between our starting point and the ending point here the array is coming in the form of matrix but if we find out the shape of this you can see that this is only a one dimensional array you can see there are 20 elements and this is a one dimensional array now to generate a random matrix you can do that by using np dot random dot rand here we have to specify the number of columns and number of rows for example if we want 5 rows and 5 columns we can write 5 comma 5 we do this and we view our matrix 4 it contains random number between 0 and 1 and this is a 5 by 5 matrix now if we want a normally distributed random numbers can do this by changing random dot rand n again 5 comma 5 there are other functions as well to create matrix such as np diag will create a diagonal matrix in which only the elements of the diagonal have the value and p dot zero will create a empty matrix in which all the elements are zero and p dot ones will create a matrix in which all the elements have value one we are not discussing this right now but you can explore this on your own Now just like in a list or strings we can also use slicings using the index number. So for example if we write mat5 0, 0, it will give me the first element of this matrix 5. If I write mat5 0, 1 It will give me the element from the first row that is the zeroth row with index 0 and the second column that is the column with index 1. So I am getting this value as output. If I want to select all this value that means all the values from first three rows I will write mat5 0 colon 3 comma colon this means all the columns so if i run this i am getting all the elements where the index is 0 1 or 2 remember 3 is excluded so we are getting row with 0 index row with 1 index row with third index and since we have provided colon that means all columns that's why we are getting all the columns there are arithmetic operations for numpy array also but we are not discussing it right now we'll move on to the pandas so pandas is a software library written for the python programming language for data manipulation and analysis this is specifically for data manipulation and analysis first we need to import pandas so we'll write import pandas spd if you are using anaconda anaconda have automatically installed pandas into your system so you don't need to install it separately you just have to import it into your workspace for pandas we will be using our customer data csv file you can find this file in the resources section of this video so go on download this file 
and put it in your folder. We will start by importing a customer.csv file. So we'll write data1, this is our variable. Then we will write a pandas function to import CSV that is pd dot read underscore CSV. Then we provide the location of our CSV file. Remember to change these backslashes into forward slashes. Then the file name customer.csv. And then headers equal to zero since our first row contain the header. If we run this, we'll get our table in variable data one. If we write data one dot head, we'll get the first five rows of our data. You can see. We have customer ID, customer name, segment, age, country, city, state, postal code and region as our columns. And then we have multiple customer details and rows. First is a customer ID. This is a unique ID for each customer. Second column is a customer name. Here we have a customer name, full name. Then there is a segment whether the customer belong to a consumer segment or corporate segment. Then we have a column for age, the age of customer, then the country, city, state, postal code and region of that customer. If you want to grab more rows, you can provide the number in this bracket. By default it is 5. If you write 10 in the output, you will get 10 rows. Now here you are seeing this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This all are the index of of this table for example zero throws will be this row if you want to add our customer id as an index since our customer id is primary key we can add it as an index we'll write this csv file into another data type that is data 2 we'll copy the above command two and we'll write another parameter that is index underscore column. We are providing the location of index column and for our data it is customer ID which is the zeroth column of our data. Since this is the first column the index is zero that's why we are providing zero similar to what we provided for headers. Since our header was present in the first row we provided zero the location of it. Here also our index column is 0. If we run this and again if we run the head of this you can see now 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 indexes are gone and now these are our indexes. These are important and we will discuss about it in a short while. Now head command is used to view the sample of your data. If you want to know statistics of your data, you write data one dot describe dot describe dot describe is a keyword and run this. So there are only two integer values in our data. That's why we are only getting two columns here first is age and second is postal code here you can see the total count of value the mean of age the standard deviation of age minimum age maximum age these are the percentile value this is a 25th percentile value so if you arrange all the age in ascending order the value present at the 25th percentile of that data is this value Similarly, this is the 50th percentile also known as the median value. This is the 70th percentile value of age and this is the maximum value of age. This we will discuss in univariate analysis. 
which we will be covering in the later part of this course. There are two ways to index a data frame. So we discussed earlier while importing this data, we can provide index column. For our data one index, we did not provide any index column. And for data two, our index column is customer ID. So if we want to view the first row of our data, we have to either use lock or I lock. If, you, if we use data one dot I lock, and then we provide zero. What I lock will do is it will grab the data that is present at the zeroth index of our data frame. So our output is same as what the first row is of our data frame. If we want to use the index column which we defined while creating our data frame, we have to use log. And in the bracket, if we write the customer ID, CG12520, in data 2, we defined our index column as customer ID. So now we can use lock keyword to get the data of this customer ID. If we run this, you can see. We are getting all the details of our customer except the customer ID since this is the index column. Similarly, if I don't know this ID and I just wanted to grab the first customer, I can use iLock. Here also I am getting the same detail. Here I was using iLock. With iLock you have to use the serial number 0 and so on. With lock you can use the index column that you provided earlier. So if you know the position you can use iLock and if you know the value you can use the lock. Just like in list and data frame you can also mention multiple values using colon operator so for example if i write data2 dot dot i lock 0 colon 5 this will give me the data of first five rows where the index value is 0 1 2 3 and 4 remember 5 is excluded from this result so i am getting data of this 5 plus summer you can use steps as well if I write 2 and run this I'm getting only 3 results since I'm using steps that's all for Panda now let's move on to next library which is Seaborn Seaborn is a library for data visualization most commonly used library is matplotlib but for our course, we think that Seaborn is much more suited. That's why we will be discussing Seaborn only. If you want, you can learn about Matplotlib on your own. First, we will import the Seaborn library. We will write import Seaborn as SNS. So we have imported Seaborn as SNS. Now to plot the distribution of our age variable from our customer table, we'll write SNS dot this plot in bracket. I will mention my column name that is customer data2 dot age capital A G you can see this is histogram of our age variable this first creating bins of all the ages so the minimum value in our age variable is 18 and the maximum is 17 
python has created different bins between these two values and then it plotted the number of variables in those bins in the form of bars this is called histogram you can see most of our customer are in this last bucket this line is also known as kde kernel density estimate and we are not going into explanation on how to arrive on this line so we are just going to remove this line to remove this line we'll write sns.displot data2.h and then kde equal to false you can see now the kde line is removed if you want to see arguments of any function you can just write help and in bracket you can write that function for example in our case we'll write sns.displot it will show you the syntax of that function all the variables that it is taking and the default values of those variables so by default kde was true that's why we were getting the kde plot and you can change the value to false to to remove the kde similarly there are other variables as well you can create a rug plot if you write drug equal to true you can have a look at this and read the documentation now we will change the color of this graph as you can see color is also a variable we will just write sns.displot color equal to red red in double quotes run this you can see the color has now changed to red seaborn library comes with various data sets so now we will just import one of such database also known as iris so we will write iris iris is our name of variable containing iris data set then we'll write sns dot load underscore data set and in bracket we'll write iris we'll run this we can view a sample of this data set by using iris dot head So our data contains five columns: sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. This is the data of flowers, where we have sepal length and sepal width, and petal length and petal width, and then the species of that flower. To get the number of columns, we'll write iris dot shape, and run this. you can see there are total 150 rows and there are five columns if you want to get the mean value median value minimum value and maximum value we can also write iris dot describe this will show us some statistics of all this four columns now we'll plot a scatter plot between sepal length and sepal width to do that we'll write sns dot joint plot our x variable should be sepal length we'll write sepal length and y variable is sepal width right sepal width 
and then our data is iris. We run this, we are getting a scatter plot between sepal length and sepal width. On the top, we have a distribution of sepal length, and on the right hand side, we have a distribution of sepal width. There are other variations of this scatter plot also if you want to change the color of these dots, the size of these dots, if you want a KDE plot with this histogram, a KDE plot or a rug plot here. You can find all this with the help option of joint plot and we will discuss that during our univariate analysis. Next another important function is pair plot. So while doing our analysis instead of plotting scatter plot for all the variables we can do it for all the variables using just one command that is sns.pair plot and in bracket we just have to mention the data frame that is iris it will create a scatter plot for all the variables For example, this is a distribution of sepal length. This is a scatter plot of sepal length and sepal width. This is a scatter plot of sepal length and petal length. And this is a scatter plot of sepal length and petal width. This is a very useful command, and in a single command, we can get a scatter plot for all our variables. That's all for this video and that's all for Python crash course. This is just a crash course. We are not covering anything in deep. And as we go along, we'll discuss all these things in more detail and its application.